Good afternoon and welcome to Newspeaks Live at the Logan Symposium 2014. I'm your host, Connor Naylor, and with me on the sofa I have arguably one of the most prolific photojournalists in the world and certainly the most at this particular symposium, Kadir Van Loisen. How are you, sir? I'm um, very well. Are you enjoying the, the conference? It's an incredible conference. It's, a, it's an honour to be uh, among all those speakers. Yeah, it is good. It is, yeah. good. It is good, especially the calibre of the people we've had so far. Yeah. Like even on this couch as well. Just so basically, I want to start off with a bit of a biographical question. So originally you were a sailor, and uh, you've had, you, then you opened a shelter for victims of drug abuse and homelessness in the Netherlands. Uh, so why the shift into photography? Why the shift into photojournalism? What prompted that? Um, well, the, the, the love for photography uh, dates back uh, quite a long time. And, and when I was in high school, I, I thought I wanted to be a photographer, actually. And I, uh, uh, I learned it through books and, uh, and looking how people were doing it, because this was obviously the time of analog. This was the time mm. of uh, dark rooms and processing and <laughs> yeah, developing and uh, the magic, yeah, the real craft, I would say. Um, and. Um, so I had a dark room in my parents' uh, cupboard, and uh, so when I, I did apply actually uh, to go to, to study photography in Holland uh, when I finished high school, but uh, uh, they uh, turned me down. So fools! <laughs> look at you, look at you now. Well, that probably uh, that probably it was uh, very good that happened to me because at least uh, at that time I didn't really know what I wanted to do with photography except that I just loved the medium. So, uh, and this, yeah, this forced me actually to think about it. So I did, yes, I did a lot of other things in between and then it, uh, then I uh, discovered that the camera was uh, a very powerful uh, weapon actually. Ah, okay. I see. So uh, when you say a camera is a weapon, I mean, that kind of follows on to what I wanted to ask. Whether you, do you consider your work to be a form of art? Do you, do you consider its purpose to inform, or to entertain, to educate? to uh, warn people about things, or a mixture of all of them? Well, I don't see it necessarily, you know, that I, it, no, I, I, it's not art for me. I'm a journalist, I'm a photojournalist, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm reporting on, uh, on stories around, to, uh, around the world. Um, I'm usually working on, uh, on projects which last quite a long time, where a lot of research is involved, and uh, uh, topics which I've, feel that they are necessary to be covered. I mean, in the end of the day, journalism is, is also about producing unique stories. I mean, there's no necessity for me to do a story uh, which has been uh, done 10 times already. So I'm really, in, in my research uh, for, for stories or projects, I'm looking, really looking into that and, uh, and, and seeing what's, uh, what, what I feel necessary as, as being seen by a large audience. Oh, okay. So my stage is, uh, is the media, is, is newspapers and magazines. Um, it's, it's not, uh, no, I mean, it's not for on the wall. I mean, mm. if, if, if people want to put a p picture of mine on the wall, it's fine. So but it's not yeah, some of the things, they definitely are wall worthy. But um, yeah, so with regards to that, what do you think, I mean, summoning to mind all of the th probably millions of photographer photographs that you've taken throughout your career. What do you, uh, what strikes you as possibly the most inspiring slash moving photograph or project that you've worked on in your career? Um, well, it's always a little bit difficult if you ask the author actually uh, mm. what he th thinks is, th is the most inspiring or moving. Um, uh, yeah, I rather uh, translate it into to to impact and uh, which which stories have most impact. I mean, I, d I did a big project on the diamond industry where I basically followed the diamonds from the mines in Africa to the consumer markets in uh, in Europe and the U.S. Um, this was a project which uh, which I did uh, quite a while before. Uh, the film uh, Blood Diamonds Blood came Diamond, out, yeah. as, as many of you might recall. So, um, um, you know, I mean, it, it was a project uh, which had an impact also because, you, you know, diamonds are supposed to be something which re represents love and 
uh, trust and, and all those things which actually you will not find at the, at the mines. Yeah, you forget the human impact. Um, and uh, diamonds and, and other mi mineral resources are all, uh, often a, a reason for a conflict because they are fueling it. They're paying for it, actually. So, um, I see, you know, and it's, it's a, I think it was important for me also to make people aware, you know, and I think it's becoming more important now, you know, it's, it's important to, to be aware what you wear, you know, the clothes you wear, the, the jewelry you wear, that, that you are aware where it comes from. And I think that sometimes we are, we, something we are losing, you know, I mean, um, that, that, that people don't know actually where a hamburger yeah. comes from. We're disconnected know? from... We disconnect we it from nature or where it actually comes from. And it's very important, I think, to know this and, uh, and to speak about this. And, uh, because we, we, we share, if we want to make it work on this, in this world, we share a responsibility. Hmm, definitely. So, I mean, you mentioned like you, you tend to cover things that aren't necessarily covered by what we would term to be mainstream media. Do you, do you see yourself as, as taking up the responsibility of, of, of perhaps using your particular medium, which is obviously, as you said in your talk, as was referenced in your talk, it's uh, because it's image as opposed to word, because the, the room for opinion in written pieces is so vast, whereas compared to photography, the room for opinion is, is much, much reduced. It's seeing <coughs> and believing. So do you see yourself as uh, having a responsibility to show the world these horrible things, horrible, fantastic, beautiful, inspiring and harrowing things with well, your work. It, it comes with the job, right? Hmm. I think you, we, we all carry this responsibility and to do it in a, in a proper way. That obviously, I've seen many changes in the industry as well. I'm a still, I would call myself a photographer or a photojournalist, but um, the, you know, there's much more to it than, than there was 20 years ago. You know, it's often that I have to do video as well now that I'm doing audio recordings that, that I have to write, actually. Um, which is, in, in a way, it's great because it, it, it means that I'm very independent and it means that the, the, the end product is really mine, so there's no, not much other people involved. At the same time, the question is sometimes how much can you do on your own? <laughs> yeah. And with the whole, whole introduction of the internet and the iPad and development of apps and so multimedia is becoming a, a big thing, which, um, yeah, it, it puts a lot of pressure on you to make it, uh, to make it work and to, uh, to really deliver something which is as meaningful and powerful as it should be. I see. Okay. And, and with like, because you've obviously worked in some pretty spectacular and perhaps horrible places, I mean, apartheid South Africa and Sierra Leone with your Diamond Project and North Korea, I think, did you go into North Korea once? Like, so what... It, have you ever been subjected to censorship, for want of a better term, or, or its various manifestations? Maybe, maybe for working with the New York Times, or working on your own, uh, interacting with governments in the area, exposing things they don't perhaps want to be exposed. So what's, what, what have you experienced in that regard? Well, there's, there's lots of stories to tell, but I think, you know, it's... The, the job became more difficult than it was before. You know, I mean, a, a journalist, whether it's a writer or a photographer or a filmmaker, is supposed to be somebody who's independent and is not aligned to any side or party and is, is, kind of is able to move around neutral. Um, nowadays, it's different, right? There's, there's, there's always people, whether it's... Uh, rebel groups in, uh, in, uh, in Darfur or whether in, in Sierra Leone or you're with the American forces in Iraq or Afghanistan. Everybody is trying to push their agendas. So it's which makes it that you are becoming part of a game where you actually don't want to be part in. So that, you know, I mean, the, the fact that so many journalists get killed nowadays mm -hmm. and that so many journalists are being kidnapped nowadays is meaning that they are be becoming valuable, you know, they, they're becoming valuable for, for a ransom or for, for any other political mo motivations. So um, it's, uh, 
it's 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 harder, but you know, obviously, I love what I do, and I think it's important. So yeah, um, definitely. And like yeah, so but like you obviously said that um, the, the 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 profession has got more difficult with regards to like how how uh, valuable journalists are being perceived. Is that due to do you think a raise in the profile of uh, people wanting knowledge, people are appreciating what journalists provide more so than before? And sort of what time do you reckon that changed within like a sort of vague date frame? Um, it's a difficult question because, you know, we, we, we live in a very visual world now. You know, I was talking before about having a dark room and working on film where, where it was more considered to be a craft. I mean, today everybody is a photographer. Um, to, to take a good photograph is maybe sometimes not that difficult, but to build a good story and to do your research well, that's, uh, that's where uh, the profession comes in. So um, it's 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 difficult because it's a very visual world. We live, uh, you know, there's there's so much content we are seeing every day through the internet or in in whatever television, whatever form. So uh, it's it's difficult to stand out and to make your story being told and uh, and clear. Hmm. It's that's why you're being drowned out by the blaze of the news media, this, that, and the other. Well, it's like. still uh, it's still possible. You know, and it's all about uh, investing time and, uh, and being very accurate and, uh, and not making many mistakes. Um, you know, my advantage is, is that I'm independent. I'm a freelancer, as you call it, right? So I don't have, a, I'm not on a salary. I don't have a contract anywhere. So I, I can work for different magazines and newspapers around the world. So it gives me a lot of freedom. So if I want to work on a story a long time, it's my decision. Hmm. You know, the only problem is sometimes where the money comes from. Yeah, it's the unreliability of the income. That's perhaps not the most important thing, but it certainly is an obstacle, yeah. I mean, so moving on to, like, you've obviously done a lot of work regarding the environment, regarding climate change, and documenting images of climate change. I mean, you've been to Bangladesh, you've been to Kiribati, you've been to um, the east coast of the US, and Miami, as you talked about in your talk, and how each one of those areas is affected, perhaps relative to each other, by rising sea levels. In terms of solutions to that problem, do you think it's enough that we turn our lights off and we leave a room, or we don't leave the TV on standby, so as we don't use as much energy, so that we don't burn as much fossil fuels, and this, that, and the other, or do you think it is, there needs to be a concerted effort by corporations of governments big governments to tackle this problem or can this be dealt with sufficiently by individual initiative? Well, you know, I mean, I mean, the, the, the problem with the whole discussion about uh, climate change is that, that people f uh, feel helpless, right? They would say, what, well, what, what, what can I do about it? Um, but every little gesture, as you said, turning the light off or driving less in a car mm -hmm. or uh, helps, um, but obviously, uh, you know, I don't want to say there are no solutions, uh, but it, the, it looks pretty bleak because, you know, I mean, th the, the scientific proof of uh, global warming and rising sea levels has been around for a while. It's not something from yesterday. So how much time, how much more is needed before we start to act? And obviously, you know, I mean, Often uh, agendas are dictated by big companies, by multinationals who can be yeah. more powerful than governments. So, um, you know, the, my latest project, which is talking about the rising sea level, which is absolutely a fact and is happening, it can be slowed down maybe, but in, in the end it's, it will happen. It is happening as we speak. So it requires also that we will have to adapt. So in solutions, can be there, but they are only extending lifetime in coastal areas, maybe for a while, so but it's an not inevitable permanently. Thing. It's an inevitable thing, this one. I'm afraid, I'm, it's, it's, it's hard to say because I don't like to say it, but I think it's that we got this far now that it's uh, inevitable. Oh, wow. um, so, you know, I mean, there will be choices being made which, which coastal areas or cities will be protected and which we will, uh, 
which we uh, which will we see go. You know, I mean, obviously there's there's a big drive to save New York, and there will be a big drive to save uh, London. Um, but as you can see now already in Yorkshire, East Riding of Yorkshire, mm. uh, they gave up on many of the villages, towns there, and yeah. they are going. I studied Haysborough, and Haysborough was just falling into the sea and things like that. You can't, it's nothing you At can do. At a very, do. I mean, like very speedy pace. Yeah, it is, it is very worrying. So, I mean, like, you're, you're obviously from the Netherlands. I mean, this, this probably affects you more than you and the Bangladeshis well, more than anyone the, else in the world. Well, that's what people tend to think, uh, to think because yes, we, the, the, the greatest part of Holland is uh, below sea level. Um, at the same time, you know, I mean, it, it's been centuries that the Dutch have been uh, trying to fight the sea and uh, building coastal protection mm. systems and dikes and levees and, uh, uh, and whatever. So actually, because of that, uh, we, we probably have a little bit more <laughs> uh, lifetime than, than most of, uh, of our surrounding countries. But, uh, you know, I mean, in the end it becomes, uh, it, it, it will become impossible also for the Dutch. God, right. Because you were talking about the possibility of uh, having to relocate the whole city of Amsterdam. <laughs> Is that is that a is that a feasible project? I, I can't. Well, I can't the, the how that would work. if it's feasible, it's you know. I mean, uh, <laughs> maybe we decide that it's not feasible. But if if uh, if 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 the city of Amsterdam gets flooded in the end, then we, we will have to move. You know, and the skep the climate skepticals will always say, well, the sea has always been rising and going down, and uh, what's new? There's nothing new. Which is there's some truth to it. Except that the big difference is that it, this used to, t to take maybe a th few, a couple of thousand years or ten thousand or more years to reach a, to reach a high level, and now we are going to see this in the next one two generations. I mean, you will see some major changes uh, when yeah. you are eighty. I'm telling you. Yeah, that's definitely when. Yeah, the rate the rate that was happening now. I think by the time I'm re by the time I reach my the stage of having grandchildren, the world is going to be an extremely different place. That's definitely that's definitely true. Um, so, I mean, obviously, I don't want to. I don't. I. I you perhaps haven't th thought about this too much, but have you got something in mind for a next big project? I mean, after the after <coughs> the, um, the the climate change, or is that an ongoing thing? Well, like you know, I mean, it's it it started very small. I thought I was just going to Bangladesh, and then it became a global project, and. I thought I closed it, and now I'm not so sure anymore because I'm, the more I'm researching and the more I've seen, I started to, to realize um, how big this issue actually is. And obviously, there's a lot of places where I haven't been to where I maybe should go to. Mm, yeah, I suppose, yeah, there is, there's, always a, there's always a place to go. There's always, the problem is, is massive, as you've said, enormous. Um, okay, I think... That's all we have time for, unfortunately, because obviously you've got a busy schedule, flights to catch and all this. So we will say goodbye to and thank you very much, Kadir, for being with us this afternoon.